<clears throat> so why don't we get started? Um, so, so you're at the, uh, an event sponsored by the Data Mesh Learning Community Meetup. And the topic, the title of the event is the Topology of Data Products, Data Product Teams. Now, data has been called the fuel of the modern enterprise, and it in fact is the source of information that powers business decisions, improves operations, creates innovations, and enables outstanding customer outcomes. Data Mesh, obviously, that's why you're here. Data Mesh is a modern approach that helps us drive these outcomes more effectively and efficiently. It obviously advocates for several principles. I'm not going to cover those, but just real quickly, domain ownership with clear boundaries of data around data and empowered data product owners. Um, uh, data as a product, uh, making data discoverable, understandable, trustworthy, interoperable, having a life cycle. Uh, data self-serve, data products rather are self-serve, where platforms available to make it easy to find, consume, share uh, uh, information, all with minimal uh, manual intervention, obviously federated governance. Uh, that makes data products owners um, accountable and also provides them the local autonomy uh, that's necessary to drive speed and agility. <laughs> now, obviously, these things are resonating with the data community. That's why you're here. <laughs> and obviously, uh, this da data mesh community, while growing, is, is, is in the process of changing or transforming these principles into practice. Now, as many aspects of this, obviously, as you can imagine, data mesh architecture, data product architecture, um, patterns, tech stack, and the list goes on. But today, we're going to be talking talking about how uh, data mesh fits into the organizational domain. Specifically, what are the teams in the data mesh? What does a data product team actually look like? Where do these so-called platform teams fit in? And these are all, like I said, questions related to the topology of data products, the topic of today's discussion. And obviously the question we're gonna try and answer is, is this the key to data mesh success? <laughs> so that's where our discussion is gonna to go today. We're going to endeavor to provide some insights based off of some real world experience from our panel members, each an experienced data mesh practitioner that I'd like to now introduce. So uh, we have Jean-Georges Perrin, Amy Regatta, and Charlotte Ledoux. Uh, each of these are data mesh practitioners. Uh, tell us, I'm going to start with Charlotte. Why don't you tell us a little bit about uh, uh, yourself and uh, what you do for a living? Yes, sure. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Eric, for the, the, the meetup and the introduction. Um, so I'm Charlotte. I live in Paris. <laughs> uh, so it's 6 p.m. here. Um, I've been working in data for about seven years. Um, I worked for several consulting firms uh, in Paris specialized in data and AI. Um, I did some data mesh transformations uh, in uh, many companies, especially in the insurance uh, sector. Um, and uh, about a, a year and a half ago, I co-founded uh, the startup Valet with uh, three associates. Um, and we are building uh, the data spaces as a service. Uh, which happen to be spaces where you can uh, securely share uh, data with uh, different entities or partners, um, which really is a, a, a big uh, a big matter uh, right now, especially in Europe. The European Commission is is working hard on uh, uh, on providing uh, data sharing uh, spaces so that companies can uh, share uh, data in secure spaces. So uh, happy to be here and uh, to to share experiences. <laughs> Awesome. Thank you, Charlotte. Amy, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do for a living? Sure. Uh, oh. Amy, it looks like uh, we're not able to hear you. It looks like there's some maybe some background noise um, or such. Can you hear me? Uh, yep. Now you're coming through. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, so my name is Amy. I've been working uh, in software engineering and data for around 13 years. Um, most uh, re recently, I've been working as a data product manager uh, for Swiss Marketplace. And basically, I'm driving the data mesh transformation in our organization, where we're implementing all these uh, domain driven uh, methodology. And I'm happy to be here and always share with you uh, all the experiences. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Amy. And Jean Georges Perrin. Tell us about yourself, my friend. So um, thank you. Thank you, Eric. And uh, happy new year to everybody. We're still in the time zone of saying that. Um, 
So my name is Jean-Georges Perrin or JGP for if it's completely difficult to pronounce for a lot of people. Um, I work at PayPal where we uh, released in production uh, a data mesh, the first data mesh at PayPal in uh, December of 2022. So that's kind of a super recent, right? Um, and uh, prior to building that at PayPal, I, I was building data platforms for like 15-ish years uh, in various capacity from startups to uh, uh, Fortune 500. I live in uh, upstate New York, as you can guess by my accent. Um, <laughs> But not upstate to Mon Montreal, okay, so still still in the U.S. Um, and uh, so, uh, and I've got a spill, uh, completely, you know, I'm, I'm kind of ruining your event right now, but I've got a small e announcement to do. I, I just made a new book about Data Mesh, which I'm going, it's available now on my Etsy store. Yes. Uh, and it's much easier to understand that the, the one from from from, from Jamac, uh, and, which, which is a great book, by the way, but this one is much easier. So um, so yeah, you see, it's a, it's not as thick as well. Okay, so anyway, um, happy, to, happy to be here and to, to contribute to the community, which is growing and it's a great community to be in. Awesome. John George, thank you very much. My name uh, is Eric Broda. I'm the president of Broda Group Software Inc., uh, a small boutique consulting firm located in Toronto, Canada. And we focus on data mesh, uh, data products, data marketplaces, and data ecosystems. We build these uh, pretty well exclusively for, for big banks, insurance companies, and payment providers. Uh, so I'll be your panel moderator for today's discussion. What that really means is I get to ask the questions and you don't have to listen too much to me today. Uh, now, on an administrative note, feel free to offer any questions via chat, and I will try and inject them into the discussion uh, as we go. <clears throat> but why don't we, uh, why don't we start? Uh, so uh, the title for the session, is, as I mentioned, is Topology of Data Product Teams. So why don't we start with the basics? Um, what is a team topology? Uh, is it only about the data product team or about related teams and their interactions? Why don't we start with Charlotte? Yeah, um, so I think for me, topology is like, um, it's gonna be a pat pattern that you can repeat within the company. Um, so the topology, you're gonna, define okay what what the different data product teams what are they going to look like what are the different profiles and skills that we want to have uh, in a in a typical uh, data product team um, because you can have different um, I think we, we'll deep dive into that after maybe um, but I I mean for me it's definitely something that you can repeat uh, in different uh, maybe business entities uh, so that you can just uh, scale with many data product teams. Awesome, thank you, Cheryl. Amy, what are your what's your perspective? Um, yeah, basically for me, um, these uh, foster a rapid flow of changes, and basically to get uh, feedback from all the systems, awareness of the perimeters of a given team. So it actually helps to agilize, you know, all the processes within uh, these uh, topology of the different teams and also get the focus on you know, this, um, maybe a department or maybe a different team where you can actually focus on and agilize that part. Okay. Thank you, Amy. Uh, Jean-Georges, I know you have an opinion on many things. What do you What do you think? How would you define team? <laughs> so you, you, you're, 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 you're picturing me as an opinionated vision. Okay, so uh, that that works. My, my genes cannot cannot lie. Um, no, so so one thing that was really revealing when when I when I was starting to work on um, on a data mesh is it's how much the the alignment with teams in in a data mesh implementation are aligned to agile okay and and, and that was kind of my big revealing thing um so when you're thinking traditionally about data engineering, a lot of a lot of people in data engineering, and I'm not pointing fingers, are saying oh, we are agile, but basically they just do they're, they're just their limit in, in data engineering is okay, we do we deliver every two weeks, so we've got sprints of two weeks. So basically that's that's our version of agile. Um and and, and I think that when we're we're coming to team organization 
in in a data mesh it's bringing um it's it's bringing a lot of those um agile principle and uh, i would say even safe scalable agile frameworks that you can <clears throat> apply to to um, to um uh, to data engineering and, and that's that's kind of the patterns I was kind of looking forward as we were building our teams to deliver our first data mesh. Perfect. Uh, Jean-Marc, I'm just going to continue with you. So, so you mentioned Agile and many people have said that uh, data mesh brings Agile principles and applies them to, to data. Um, so when you think about team topologies, the teams that are in a data mesh, um, what are the various teams and how do they uh, relate or match to some of our agile practices. So, so the way we organized ourselves, okay, and I'm not saying it's 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 working for everybody, but so when 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 we started working on a on a data mesh, it was not a there was not a question of saying, hey, you're going to work on a data mesh. Here's some money. You've got one year. Have fun with it, and you do nothing else during a year. Okay, so so that's that's kind of care bear learned, uh, and it's not a real uh, a real world scenario. So we had to build the platform, and specifically, more my boss had to coordinate building the platform with as well as the. So to keep the lights on and continue the delivery of um, of of our um, of our data products uh why we were building the platform so so the way we structured ourselves we had two teams working on the data of the data software of the software software architecture software engineering part of the of the platform and we had our two we had also two teams working more specifically on data engineering and delivering uh, uh, and delivering what was expected from our team while we were building the platform. So we accumulated a little bit of tech debt, and, and which, which is which is normal in this kind of situation. But now we are we are looking at as we are as I'm talking now, we're converging not the teams themselves, but the efforts um, to make sure that what the tooling that the platform is bringing is now completely uh, useful and operatable by uh, the, the, the data engineers in, in the other teams. So, there's, so, so that's the evolution we are, we're seeing now. Okay. Uh, in, 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 parallel, in parallel to that, uh, because we are a major organization, we had to interact with, um, with our business unit, with business units, okay? So which are actually the consumer of, 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 of our data products, as well as the, um, as well as the infrastructure providers, we are not owning our own infrastructure on what we, on what we deploy. Right? It's it's uh, it's something uh, it's something done by. If you're thinking about the, the three planes uh, of a data mesh uh, architecture, the infrastructure experience plane, this is not something we, we control. Okay? So we, we we can recommend, but we don't control. So 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 that's kind of the big. Uh, I would say it was a complete um, uh, scenery uh, from a 30,000 30, feet uh, perspective. Fantastic, Jean-Georges. Charlotte, when you, when you look at uh, some of your experiences, Jean-Georges Jean has obviously shown there's some, some similarity between the teams that we have in the agile world and the teams that we have in the data mesh world. Um, what, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, yeah, they definitely agree with the, the links with the agile world. Um, I think for some companies, sometimes it, what can be difficult is that like they have uh, project managers, but what they need is data project managers, which is a, a slightly different. <laughs> um, and they, they sometimes have a hard time understanding how is this different, uh, what new skills are required. Um, and what I've seen in the, it was for an insurance company, uh, kind of the same, uh, like uh, there, there was a, a platform team uh, in charge of uh, uh, providing um, uh, the data and especially the different stages between raw uh, refined uh, data. Uh, and then they were providing this to uh, several data product teams uh, that were just uh, uh, receiving uh, 
data and then managing this, preparing, transforming, uh, realizing some modelization data science on it, uh, and then providing this to uh, final business users uh, under several forms. Uh, could be, of course, uh, reporting, uh, but also like, um, I mean, um, I've seen a great article which defines the different types also of data products that we can find, because this is a question that we have all the time also. Um, and I like to, to have this kind of definition where you can have some data products that are more like analytics. So this is going to be reporting dashboards. And you can also have data products that are going to be um, more on what it's called data activation. So it can be like a, a research engine or a, a recommendation uh, engine that is going to be embedded in uh, a, a business application. Um, so yeah, mostly it's it was platform team and then different data product teams. Okay, perfect. Charlotte, thank you very much. Hey, Amy, we wanted to get your thoughts on this. So, so uh, Charlotte mentioned something that I thought was a, a very nice distinction. One is um, a data product manager is not the same as a product manager, which is definitely not the same as a project manager. So, so how, how would you contrast the difference between those three type of roles? Yeah, totally. Um, for example, I have a recent example. Uh, since we are implementing the data mesh, sorry, first, uh, can you hear me well now? Is, is it yep, much better good. than before? Okay. Cool. Um, okay. So basically, uh, you know, I, I one of the domains, the first one that we actually roll out, it was with a person who was a product manager, but she never worked with data before, and for her it was so complicated and so hard to understand what a data product is, what does a data engineer do, or what a data analyst do. They just want to see some kind of report from someone, and they don't understand the whole background on it, right? Um, it requires a lot of training for these people because they really need to understand how to work with data people, what it means to work with data and what's the value they bring. And they can keep uh, leaning towards uh, the side of the product, you know, more backend engineering, more front end and putting more importance on that. So, you know, data mesh is basically like a cocoa wash where you have to kind of bring all the people together to understand how data works. And I can tell that uh, definitely a person that hasn't worked with data shouldn't be leading, for example, a domain at the very beginning because they need to be retrained for sure from the very beginning again and start to understand the whole topology of the product, uh, of the teams, uh, the products and, and how it works and what's the value bringing uh, to the company. <clears throat> Uh, a project manager, on the other hand, I mean, we have also for central teams and from or other departments, project managers that are just managing, I don't know, finance, marketing, and some others. I have worked with them uh, with the advertising team. And there is uh, some uh, project managers working uh, for some domains that we needed someone, you know, as a deputy or owner of the data. But if you explain them and you kind of put them as a uh, owner or deputy, it's easier that put them to manage a whole domain. So maybe starting just putting them as owners of the data and retraining them little by little, they will get you know much better into these topics. But for me, it's key to be able to pull you know, the data mesh correctly in your organization that you have data product managers or data product owners who take the ownership of this product and be able to drive it end to end because this person will do a lot of politics in between all these uh, backend parts and, you know, all the data world and the business side. Awesome, Amy. Thank you very much. So, so Jean-Georges, I'm going to ask you to comment that, but I'm going to give you a little bit of context here. So, so uh, Amy started to get into the details of some of the roles, responsibilities of a data product, uh, data product team. So obviously a data mesh is an ecosystem of interacting data products. So when you think of a, a data product team, what what at PayPal and in, in your experience, what are the key roles and responsibilities uh, within the data product and of the data product team? So we've been we've been struggling a little bit about I think the key role of the data product owner. Okay. Um, I think that in in a lot of organization. A lot of people just don't want to own anything, right? And, and uh, uh, so, when you're saying you're a data product owner, it scares people out a little bit. So, what we've decided to do is to keep this role inside the team for now, <laughs> um, to make to make sure that people get comfortable 
while we also get comfortable to that okay it's it's kind of a little bit i would say it's 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 in some way it's a little bit complicated as well right it's a it's it's still new okay so so let's not push the burden to 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 someone else who which doesn't half understand the, the concept or or um or, and we don't completely master it as well okay so 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 i think that that's that that's the approach we are having now that we understand a little bit more the the, the data product ownership uh, it's 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 time for us to uh, push it i would say a little bit more towards uh, the people that should be the data owners okay so um and and so it's it's work in progress okay so but let's say we we try to keep the thing in our team okay i'm not trying to say we we created a centralized data team okay but that's not the case but but we we try to explore what the different worlds the interaction and the change we are, we are going through before before we can actually push it on someone else Perfect. Now, uh, Cheryl, let me ask you: <clears throat> when you when you look at some of the the roles in a data product team, I've, I've seen uh, folks say that uh, obviously a DBA uh, may may have a role in there, a data architect, a data engineer, a release manager, on top of what what John George already called out the the data uh, product owner. Um, what, what what are the the critical roles that you have to get right uh, in a data product team? Yeah, um, sometimes what's interesting in a team, yeah, so you can have some um, subdivision uh, within the team uh, of different aspects of, uh, of the data product. Um, so what I've seen also interesting is that you can have a, a part of the team that is going to be focused on the, the model. Um, so this is going to be, of course, a data scientist uh, profile. Uh, of course, that is going to be very important here. Uh, and then the other part of the team is more going to be uh, focused on the, the activation uh, of, of the data product, like uh, uh, giving it to the final user uh, in the, the, the form that is required. Uh, so here you're more going to have to need, of course, uh, DevOps uh, profiles, uh, but date, what we call now data ops, because of course uh, you need to have a, a model into production here. Um, and yeah, I mean, you're going to have also some UI UX uh, if the product uh, requires some specific uh, interface for the for the business people. Um, but yeah, I think it's in interesting to see how you can also have some support uh, to have different, um, I mean, to have the, the specific profiles that are required for these different parts of the, of the data product. Awesome. Thank you. Charlotte, Amy, what's your perspective? What is in your experience? What what do you actually have to get right? What is that? What is that key outside of the data product owner? What is the key role that you have to get get right? Sure, we split it a little bit uh, different uh, from the topologies uh, of uh, data teams. You know that is around on the internet or in the book. Um, we do have, of course, the data product owner, and uh, depending on the team, if he's a consumer line or if he's a producer line. We will have a backend engineer, data engineer, uh, data analyst, or a BI developer. Or, for example, also we require on each of these um, teams to have also a business data owner, which is someone from business that will actually provide definitions for metrics, test cases, but from the business perspective. Uh, so we can actually, you know, understand the business logic and start to put some anomaly detection tests automated in there as well. And also we have a technical data owner that might be not necessarily the, the data product owner, but a, a technical person that uses that data to produce, you know, uh, some reports or some other stuff. Like we have a monetization team, for example, and part of this monetization team, they are a business analysts, but a little bit more technical. And they use this data a lot and they know how they work and what is the technicalities and also all the business logic. So one of these persons is actually the owner, the technical owner, and the other person is the, the business data owner. So we have on top of the technical people and the data product owner, these other two roles that are the ones who are going to give maintenance, for example, to, to the data catalog part. 
where they will be able to uh, be able to verify if that product is complete, if it's uh, GDPR compliant, if they have a lot of things. And that's how we foster uh, the ownership of the products in the company right now. Okay, perfect, Amy, thank if, you. If, if, if I may bounce back on, on what just Amy said, we, we, we are having, we're trying to, so the way we've been working, we've been working, okay, so I'm in a BU, we've, we've built, we've, 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 we've been building that in a BU, but by working very closely with our enterprise data governance team, we've isolated the exact same scenarios that, that Amy is describing, right? Like a, a technical data uh, data product owner or a business uh, data product owner, and 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 we are not completely sure yet on how this is going to work for us. But but I'm I'm seconding that that kind of uh, ideas there. Perfect, John George. Let me continue with you. So so data product owners, uh, if you read Zemak's book, clearly they have a high degree of local autonomy. Um, but what decisions is a data product owner actually empowered to make? Can they, can they, for example, make a decision on the tech stack? Can they uh, override, if you will, the enterprise architecture selection for a particular product? Um, where, where do you draw the line in terms of a data product owner? How do you make them accountable and empowered, but nevertheless uh, do the right thing? Uh, as long as they agree with them, they can do whatever they want. They agree with me. It's fine. They can do whatever they want. <laughs> uh, but 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 more, more more seriously, the thing is, so so the parallel to the to the to the product owner. Okay, the way I see it is is the architect or the solution architect. Okay, so so in my mind, I always kind of you know this this eighty twenty rules uh, percent rule. So when I'm thinking about the, the data product, the product owner, I think this guy or this person should be eighty percent uh, business, twenty percent technical. And on the other end, I've got the, I've got my architect, and is eighty percent technical, twenty percent business. Okay. Um, and when you when you when you've got both of them together, then that's why uh, that's that's where you you I think you achieve great results. Um, so if the data um, if the data product owner comes to me and say, "Well, I really would like you to rewrite all you did in C sharp," <laughs> it's not going to end up very well. Okay, but if he comes to me and says, uh, if they come to me and say, "Hey, um, I want an SLA of that and I want freshness to be that and retention period to be that. Okay, that's that's the kind of expectation I'm I'm waiting from the data product owner. He needs to tell me how mm -hmm. business is going to use the data that I'm providing. Okay, so you give you tell me, hey, I want data like freshness should be two minutes. Okay, it has an impact on how we are building things, right? Compared to uh, whatever, whenever you want, right? So, so, so this is this is this is the 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 requirement that I'm kind of expecting from from the from the data product owner. Okay, uh, and this will this will have some 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 consequences on the architecture, uh, and because each. I wouldn't say that each data product is unique in, in, in all the features it brings, okay? It's kind of a standardized product, but some of the implement the underlying implementation, especially when it comes um, when it comes to the uh, to, to the data pipelines and data stores and all those things can vary widely depending on the data product you're building. Mm -hmm. So so Charlotte, what's the what's your perspective? Let me get, let me actually give you a, a little bit of a scenario. So, and, and it's a contrived scenario. But let's say there's an enterprise standard that says Java is the language that uh, we use to program in at this particular enterprise. And let's say that uh, we are going down the data mesh journey. We have a data product aimed at data scientists, and they say, no, 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 I want to use Python, which is, is obviously the, the 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 favorite tool for data scientists. 
Um, how do you, how does a data product owner reconcile that situation? And again, this is a contrived scenario, but you can see there's a healthy tension between what the enterprise may want for, for perhaps very valid reasons and a data product may, owner may want it for different reasons, maybe favoring agility and speed over cost. How, how, how do you handle that scenario? What's, how, how, how have you done that before? Yeah, um, I think what's um, also important in the, the data product owner uh, role um, is that, of course, as he's close to the business, uh, like jean jean mentioned, um, he knows the value uh, of what's going to be produced, but he owns his team uh, and the different skills. So in this case, uh, he knows that the team um, is skilled uh, with Python and that is uh, the the language uh, of data science above all. Um, so I point here for him is to um, to manage, I mean, to show at least to the, the management, the, the to draw a business case of this, like, okay, this is gonna take us, um, I don't know, like one, uh, one month uh, in Python, whereas it's gonna be uh, three months, or I know if it's Java, I need to recruit people, and it's gonna take much more time before we can provide final value uh, to the business. So it's, I think it's just, yeah, you need to, he needs to set up the business case and to show that in terms of ROI, it is much more interesting to do this in Python. And um, I mean, in my opinion, in general, when you when you talk to the man top management uh, in terms of ROI, then you, you have a, 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 this is well received in general. <laughs> so. Perfect. So, so Amy, what, what's your thought? I mean, uh, how do you balance off? Uh, what Charlotte said is, is it really boils down to, uh, is there an effective business case, so to speak, to, to, for, for the decisions that are made? How, how have you addressed this challenge in the past? Yeah, well, actually, in our uh, specific case, um, the data pro owner won't really in, interfere in the stack to be chosen, usually um, from the data platform slash enablement team so we are the ones who provide you know all the infrastructure all the tools and everything and then you can choose from that catalog whatever works for you right so i think in this case they are very autonomous they they uh, we provide also to them templates um for dvt for example for uh the way they work uh, with um, the projects in gcp how they name it name convention all the governance is provided by us and then uh, the teams are basically free to do whatever they want also we use templates uh from what uh jpg talked about about um you know i want this freshness i want these um you know for the data i wanted to, to have these columns uh these tables and these and that so they have a data product value proposition um template that needs to be filled out with the business people plus uh you know the data product owner and both figure that out before actually the development is started because we want to start a new domain or a new data product unless this is already filled out so we have clarity on what they want and that is helping us to actually focus on the products that really matter and not focusing on products that you know business will come always telling you i want 10 products and maybe they just only need one so that's a way to kind of uh, give autonomy to these uh, domains to talk to the business people with the data product manager and then basically you know agree on what's the most important what they want how they want it to, since the very beginning to avoid you know redesigning the product every time because they want changes in the middle of the road awesome awesome thank you amy charlotte i'm gonna i'm gonna shift gears a tiny bit here and ask you to to respond to this next question so so one of the one of my absolute favorite books is, is called Team Topologies, and you can see uh, I use this as we entitled the session. But it's by Matthew Skelton and Emmanuel Pais, uh, and again, the Team Topologies defines uh, several different types of teams. They call them stream-aligned teams, platform teams, enabling teams, and complicated system teams. So what I want to talk a little bit about is 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 the platform team, the, the platform team, and how it enables the data product. So, so the key key principle that Data Mesh has is we want to provide self serve capability. So, if you think about the mission of a, a data product team and the self serve capability and all the other stuff that needs to be, what is the role of this platform team that sits outside of uh, of the the data product team, and how does it overlap with what a data product team would actually do? Yes. Yeah, so, for um, platform team, I think they 
they have to provide the um, the infrastructure, uh, data infrastructure or a layer uh, uh, of the of the whole data mesh, of course. Uh, and then the different teams can draw, uh, I mean, yeah, draw the data uh, and then build, um, I mean, each data product team, uh, as it is autonomous, then they can build their own pipeline and take the data from the, the platform team and then draw their own pipeline, their own transformation to build the final data product. So the platform team is really here um, uh, to manage um, the whole infrastructure, make sure it is scalable uh, and provide the, the tools or even some uh, templates, uh, like Amy mentioned, the, the, the templates as well, um, for all the whole teams. So, um, and this is also a way for them to make sure uh, that every um, data product, every pipeline, also going to comply, uh, like if there's some, um, I don't know, some specific rules uh, regarding uh, some data or security rules, uh, it's also a way to ensure uh, this is uh, well done by all the, the different teams. Awesome, Charlotte. Amy, what is it, what is your perspective? When, you, when you've uh, implemented data products and you had your data product team, you, you obviously interact with the platform. How did you enable that self-serve capability? What were some of the key capabilities that, that you relied upon this data platform team? Yeah, we, uh, as a data platform slash enablement team, because we have both combined because of resources, uh, basically we took in consideration all the, uh, the data governance part, the cloud governance as well, all the uh, data catalog uh, implementation that we were going to do. Um, and all, of course, all these templates that I mentioned, like the data product value proposition, the data product canvas, and the data contracts as well, because we provide those templates for them as well. And um, we enable basically the domains to be able to deliver those data products. So we intervene at the very beginning when we are creating a domain, we provide them all the solutions, all these templates, training uh, to all of them. And, and of course we help, you know, some teams that they don't have a real, you know, data engineer in their team, but they use these no code tools, for example. So we provide also that and some guidance and maybe some support to a certain extent to be able to uh, help them. Um, and the difference uh, for me will be like uh, for the data domain team, they are actually delivering a data product it could be a curated data set, could be a dashboard, could be a machine learning model or, you know, whatever you would like to do with your data. But it's a whole process end to end since the very beginning with the discussions until you really deliver something that brings a value. Platform and enablement is basically enablers um, provide tools, supports other teams to adopt all these new practices. And if you don't have this foundation very strong since the very beginning, it's very difficult to control what the other data domains are going to do because everybody needs wants to do whatever they want. Uh, each team wants to do their own stuff. But if you already have this foundation, they will know what to follow. And we also have, uh, we are thinking in implement this role of having, um, you know, like these uh, data product manager who will be in charge probably from the platform team to uh, check, you know, like auditory to see how the domain is set up just to make sure People keep following the rules, retrain people, uh, introduce new tools, collect uh, like a satisfaction survey to understand what other products might be helpful for certain teams. Because we have a lot of data, uh, a lot of business units with different type of data and different stuff. So the way to control a data mesh in a higher scale is to create this foundation scalable already so the other teams can grow with you and basically grab you as an example of what needs to be done. Otherwise, everybody will do whatever they want. Okay, Amy, thank you very much. Jean-Georges, uh, Jean um, uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about uh, governance, sometimes a very bad word uh, in, an, in an organization. So, so obviously, Zamak in her book has highlighted a, a federated governance model. So that has some different uh, uh, implications. And when you think about one of the goals of data mesh is, is, is especially with the data product owners, we want to foster uh, local autonomy. How do we balance local autonomy um, with data product governance? How do, we, how do we balance the need to address what the enterprise requires while balancing off the speed and agility and local autonomy that a, a data product owner requires? 
bribes. It always works. <laughs> uh, so, 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 just, just kidding, of course. Uh, but, but, um, so, some of my favorite people and and PayPal are actually the data governance team. Um, they, they, we've got, a, we have a an excellent relationship with them. They understood very clearly uh, and very soon that if you've got this complete top-down uh, governance approach that a lot of people are trying to do, okay, uh, you're, 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 you're going to fail. Um, but if you leverage and you give autonomy to the, to the teams, well, then you're, you're multiplying your efforts, right? You're, you're, no, sorry, you're, you're multiplying your, your manpower without increasing the effort. So basically, that's where I see the federation, the benefits of a federation working, right? Like you can't have, and, and I'm going to, to, to poke on, on, on France versus the US, okay? We've got a very central, and I know both countries pretty well, you've got a very central, government in France, which is kind of driving every decision possible, where in the US, we rely a lot on the different states, with, which have different powers. And, and I like this analogy, because it's the same thing in an organization, okay, when you're closer to the field, when you're on the factory plant, you know, better what your what your data is looking like what what your data is 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 representing and you've got access to the experts in the, in the data there okay so so you collect this information at the at the factory floor kind of uh, level and you combine that with the policies that needs to be um, uniform and, and consistent for the entire organization so and data mesh allows that okay I, I don't know any other paradigm in data engineering and that that allows that as easy as that okay i'm not saying it's easy to implement but it, but the par is a paradigm and the principle is kind of mentally i think intellectually kind of easy to understand um and 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 that works because of course there's no there's a there's a mutual trust okay between the the enterprise data governance and so local data governance as well okay it's not like it's going back to the politics analogy it's not like the u.s congress right now okay they they trust each other they can do things together and 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 i think it's working okay it's it, it's it, we're, we're still in, in the infancy of that but but basically everybody understands that there's it's it's going to mutual benefit of everybody okay so if i'm taking my own share of data governance then then um then it's not someone else is not coming to impose it on me. Okay, so I, th I think I think that's 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 where we're we're it's a win-win. It's really a win-win scenario in this in, in, for, for for us. Absolutely great, great, uh, great uh, answer, Jean George. Um, I'm going to go to uh, the chat, and I see a question. Uh, I'll go with this one here that I see right now. Uh, it's from Philippe. Uh, so Charlotte, I'll start with you to get your perspective on this. So Philippe says, do you think we need to reevaluate cross-functional teams to evolve into data, into the data mesh world? Or uh, is this culture, uh, will this culture be compatible with what you have today? I would love to, here's the final part of the question. I would love to see what are the structures or team topologies for that wide and so cross-functional teams. Yeah. Um... I mean, yeah, it, it would be interesting also to get more information about what's here uh, for Philippe, a cross-functional team. Um, but because it can be, of course, uh, teams that are answering to several uh, domains. So it can be a platform team, but it can also be uh, um, a central governance team. So for me, uh, this... Uh, yeah, it, it can be this in, in a data mesh world, uh, or it can also be a, a domain which is just cross-functional. So this means this is a domain that is going to um, get some data from another, uh, from two other maybe different domains, um, do something with it, and then um, give it back to some consumers. So um, I, I, I don't see why this wouldn't fit <laughs> in the data mesh world i think i uh, just need to define more clearly what is a uh, what is this cross-functional teams for philip 
Awesome. Thank you. Hopefully, Philip, that uh, answered your question. Uh, Amy, I'm going to uh, ask you the next question. Um, so one of the, the things we talked about is the, the team topology, but there's, there's obviously uh, a relationship to uh, what people call the operating model. Uh, how the teams interact and the various incentives. How, how do you differentiate the the team topology, the responsibilities in the individual team relative to the, the broader operating model discussion? Um, we actually, I think this, um, you know, I'm actually implementing these domains now in one of the business units. What we did uh, with the data product owner from one of those domains that we're implementing is basically go and basically draw this perimeter, you know, to the to be able to understand where they belong, you know, to each other, so they don't get in across each other and kind of fight uh, to understand or or which product is from who. So I did an event storming uh, where we actually identify, you know, the microservices, all the sources, and everything how they interact, just to understand which domains were, you know, source align or. Um, sorry, so uh, producer, consumer, or this kind, of, or even if it's a, a, a complicated subsystem. And that's how you kind of, uh, basing on this operating model, how you can divide. But it's very important to put this uh, perimeter there. Otherwise, uh, the things get lost. And if you do it um, with all the domains and all the teams together, you make sure that uh, one business unit will be able to work without, uh, you know, crashing in between and uh, not grabbing uh, data from others or grabbing data, but responsibly, like using the data contract, whatever is necessary or these kind of things, right? To avoid changes and then go back to the old ways where uh, the, th the products get broken. No one knows uh, where and, you know. Okay, perfect. So, so Jean-Georges, uh, there's one, maybe one of our last questions here from Catherine in the chat, um, specific to you. Where are the teams that you talked about located in the organization? Are they, these data product teams, are they within the business? Where, where do you see them in, in PayPal? Uh, it's, it's not an easy key solution it's not an easy answer uh without pulling my org chart which you know 30,000 people or so in it uh, so the way we are structured and is is i would say is not the ideal way um it's a good way but it's 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 i, I think i think that there could be a better model but but anyway the way we've the way we've done it is we we have we we own our data engineers okay so so whether 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 they are paper people from paypal or uh external contractors we we have we have a few of that as well uh but they belong they belong to us and if you see a if you see an organization where you've got a big bus and, and smaller bus under it and, and blah 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 basically the way we are we, the way we are working is we serve three three small BUs, um, and, and and this small this small BUs uh, have obviously different needs, but they also have they all the three of them need, need need data. Okay, so instead of having data engineer attached to each BU, we um, we factorize the teams there, so that's and and we serve three BUs. Okay, so so that's 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 how it that's how it works. Okay, so um, and and we uh, uh, and and you, the, the, I would say the, the data product owner um, and owners in the future is is kind of the facing person towards these BUs. Okay, and, and that's uh, so. So it's not really in business. It's it's more in business than technology. Okay. So if, when you're thinking about PayPal, uh, I'm very far away from the people that are building PayPal.com. Okay. Um, uh, but uh, and I'm, but I'm 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 closer to the business. Okay. And and that's that's how we structure the thing. So if you, if you see the pendulum a little bit. Okay. So it's not I'm I'm not completely not in technology and i'm not completely not in business um we we're kind of a little bit floating around there 
Um, but we've got the idea is that okay, you've got you've got your you've got your leadership, you've got your your organization structure, right? But and, and PayPal has been fantastic for that. Is you've got access to other people because yeah, I I cannot build my product without the infrastructure. So I need to talk to the people in charge of infrastructure, right? So, and it's not, I, I'm not climbing the ladder and go back down, right? I'm, I'm, I'm just going to ask them. Uh, and, uh, and, and I think this is, this is a, the, the channels, the communication channel and the stakeholders on your project that makes it easier. So. Thank you, Jean-Georges. Uh, Amy, I'm gonna start with you on the next question. is maybe the last one based on the time we have. This is in the chat. Uh, follow up to Philippe's question, in terms of a stream aligned team or data product team, do you see the data product owner and data engineers added to the stream aligned team? So I, I think, do we have, how, what's the scope and magnitude of the data engineers in the data product team? Here we go. Uh, trying to unmute, there we there go. There you go. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> uh, absolutely. Uh, every single um, stream aligned team, either it's, either it is a producer or a consumer team, needs to have a data product owner and a data engineer. Because at the end of the day, you need to um, you know, have uh, this ingestion of the data. You need to have probably some transformations here and there. And then, um, you know, it depends on the product you're going to provide. For example, there is one team for us that only has uh, one data engineer, and that's enough for that team because they produce just a curated data set. They don't produce uh, a, a dashboard out of it. So for sure, for her, for the, in this case, it was just the data product owner and the data engineer and a backup engineer because the, the, the data is coming basically from a microservice. So it's a very small team. It's a little bit mix, mix or uh, cross-functional, as Philippe said, because you will have also backend and, and data people. But for sure, in every single one, you will need at least a data engineer and the data product owner as a base for a, for a stream aligned team. Perfect. Thank you, Amy. Char Charlotte, I'll ask you to provide some final comments and then we'll close. Uh, so what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, I completely agree with Amy. I think as long as you have um, to serve some consumers, uh, you need these profiles on your team, a data product owner and data engineer as well, as is crucial, <laughs> I'd say. So yeah, agree on this. Perfect. I'll tell you what, with two minutes left till we finish, uh, I'm gonna close. And first I'll say thank you to our audience uh, for listening to us and participating and asking some great questions. And obviously I wanna thank Charlotte, Amy and Jean-Georges as our esteemed panel members. Uh, thank you very much for your wonderful insights. Uh, and with that folks, uh, we are done and I'm gonna stop the recording.